Good afternoon. It is a real pleasure to be in beautiful North Carolina with you today. I want to thank uh, New Schools for having invited me to address you this afternoon and to talk about the important work you're doing to create the schools we need for the 21st century. Before diving into my remarks, I just want to also commend Jennifer for hers. Uh, when I heard she wanted to be a teacher, I was so impressed. But when I saw her on stage with the poise and the presence, I said, well, that might actually be a future politician in the, in the audience there today. So I just want to say uh, it is always a good sign when we can uh, take pride in our students. And uh, Jennifer certainly assumed we could take some pride in. So thank you for your remarks today. Uh, it's great to be here. It's good to be uh, with you in the summer when you have a chance to reflect on the important work you're doing, work that we know is critical to educating the next generation of students, work that you often do under incredible constraints, Cre constraints created by shrinking budgets, constraints created by a changing society with demographic change, uh, families in change, uh, constraints created by policy. As we know, uh, unfortunately, education is increasingly a politicized policy matter. Uh, I often say new governor means new reforms. <laughs> right? New legislature, new reforms. New mayor, they, mayors want to get on it too. They want to be on the reform action as well, and of course, superintendents and board members. And all of that results very often in a highly politicized environment that we're working in. If I had it my way, we would make education a totally nonpartisan issue, treat it like highways and the water. Politicians can't touch it. Just leave it to a, an appointed body, because <laughs> it's really too important to allow political agendas to tamper with. But unfortunately, we don't have it my way. So um, we get what our politicians bring us. Uh, and unfortunately, in the name of education, uh, it's ironic in a lot of ways, isn't it, that when it comes to reforming our schools, we are more likely to consult with business leaders than educators. <laughs> right. uh, even educators who've gotten a track record of success often have no say at all in policymaking. Uh, and I think it reflected very often in what we are doing. So I'm going to frame my remark today around what I call capacity building work in schools. It's very consistent with the design principles of the new schools work that you're doing. Um, although I'm going to try to push you in some different directions as well that I hope don't sound uh, at all uh, outside the margins. I think they w hopefully will resonate with the work you are doing. Uh, but I often find that when I meet educators who are trying hard to figure out how to ensure that their schools are meeting the needs of the students they serve, that sometimes they miss out on some things that are really, really important and critical. And consequently, the data shows they're not serving all their kids well. Right? And until that data demonstrates that a child's background does not determine how well they do in our schools, then we know we have work to be done. Right? I truly believe that education is the key to the American dream in this country. I believe that because I've lived it. And I would guess that there are people in this audience who've lived it. How many of you come from a family where neither of your parents graduated from college? Raise your hand. Look around the room. Lots of folks. And I imagine that most of you have gone to college now, so you are living proof that you don't have to have college-educated parents to go to college and become a professional. How many of you come from families where neither parent graduated from high school? Look around the room. Still lots of hands up, mine included. Neither of my parents graduated from high school. They managed to send all six of us to college, some of the best colleges in the United States. We are living proof that your background should not determine what you can accomplish in education. Now I want you to ask yourselves, as you think about your students in your schools and how well they're doing, are the backgrounds of your children determining their achievement? That is, when you look at the honors classes and the advanced placement classes and the remedial classes and the special ed classes, Who's there? And if what you find is that your school is, in effect, reproducing the existing patterns of inequality that exist in your community, then you know that's what you've got to focus on. You've got to focus on breaking that predictability. 
Because the truth of the matter is this. There is talent in the trailer parks, isn't there? And there's talent in the housing projects, and there's talent in those single-parent households, and even in those homeless shelters. There's talent, too, there, isn't there? And we know this. If those children have athletic talent, we'll find them, won't we? We'll find them in the most remote village in Nigeria. Right? We need to be as deliberate about cultivating intellectual talent in our children, regardless of where they come from. Regardless. Our schools have to be in the business of cultivating talent in children. Cultivating talent in children. Not measuring and sorting. That was the old way. We used to look at kids, make decisions about their ability very early, sometimes even as early as kindergarten, who was bright and who was not. We were laughing at the table about parents who take great pride like I do in the fact that my 15-month-old daughter knows 60 words already. She, she has a bigger vocabulary than many two-year-olds. But guess what? As a parent of five, I also know, guess that's not necessarily mean she's a genius. Some kids walk early, some kids talk early. Right? Developmentally, we know that there's a range at which kids will do things, there's a pace, and they're not all the same. If you're serious about equity for all children, then we also have to be serious about addressing their individual differences too, because they're not all the same. And we have to be able to create schools that can be responsive to those differences and don't make the mistake of making early judgments about children which limit their chances. So I start that because I think all of that is central to building capacity in schools. And I would also acknowledge that capacity building work is not the same as the kind of, I gotta make sure I point at the right place, <laughs> reform work. Okay, oops, so there we go. That often is being promoted, uh, particularly by the federal government right now. I would say that right now, under the guise of improving schools, we get a lot of recipes and prescriptions for change that sometimes make no sense at all. You know, fire the principal, as if there's a, a good principal waiting for their chance to get that job, right? And those of you who live in rural North Carolina know that, guess what, that's the only principal we got right now. Right? Or fire half the teachers. That's another one of their prescriptions. Which half? Right? <laughs> and how do we know? Why not 60%? Why not 30%? I mean, these formulas really are kind of contrived and, and, and arbitrary. So I want to acknowledge that as a constraint, too. But I also want to say that we've still got work to do. Because children like Jennifer and others like her can't wait for our politicians to get it right. So you're on the front lines of making sure that we do educate this next generation. And that means that you've got to be very clear about the work itself. What do I need to focus on? So I want to start by saying that the key distinction to understand is be between what I call the technical work of reform and of managing schools and the adaptive work. The technical work is important. That's about managing your schools, making sure largely that you're in compliance with state and federal policy. That you test the children when they're supposed to be tested, that there's no cheating that the buses run on time, that people get paid, that there are credentialed teachers in the classroom. There are lots and lots of regulations to running a school, and we've got to make sure that we're doing it. At the same time, the technical work will never enable you to educate all the children because the technical work is not about hope or inspiration or about engagement and motivation. That's adaptive work. It's adaptive because it's work you don't do simply by checking off a box. It's work that you have to reflect on and you have to ask yourself, are we having an impact? Are we making a difference? Are my teachers inspired? Not just present, not just covering the material, but inspired to motivate my students. Do they know how to build strong relationships with those students? 
Because a lot of our kids will work for teachers they like and choose not to work for teachers they don't like. And what many educators don't realize is that building that relationship is central to the work itself, isn't it? Because children learn through relationships. And too often we have teachers, especially in high schools, who confuse teaching with talking. They will tell you, I covered the material. And that's not the question they should be asking, is it? Should be, did they learn the material? I remember as a brand new teacher in Providence, my mentor teacher told me, when you teach American history, your job is to get the kids from the Revolution in September to the Vietnam War in June. That's your job, here's the book. I'll be in the back watching. I said, well, wait, what about the Constitution? Isn't the Constitution important? He said, don't get caught up in the Constitution because you got to be at the Civil War by December. I said, well, the, December, the Civil War is really complicated. He said, you don't get it, do you? He said, you have to be at the Depression by Easter. Then I got it. He was not worried about whether or not our kids learned history. He was concerned about whether or not I covered the book. Covering the book and teaching children to appreciate science or math or English or to develop a love of learning are different tasks. What are your teachers focused on? Are they teaching students or are they covering the material? Are they focused on raising scores or are they focused on getting children to be excited about learning? So they become willing and participants, invested as learners in their own education. That's adaptive work. It's adaptive because it's work you don't just do by showing up. You actually have to think about it. You have to be creative. You have to talk to your colleagues and collaborate about it because otherwise we lapse into complacency. And schools where people are complacent because they're just getting paid and they're just doing the same thing they did last year or 20 years ago are schools that will never make a difference because they don't have the sense of mission, much less the passion that's needed to educate this generation of children. In far too many schools, we expect the children to learn the way we teach. And if they can't do it, we blame the children or blame their parents or both. And every time I go to a school where they're blaming children and parents or blaming the politicians, I know this is a school that will not make a difference because they're not focused on the things they control. They're focused on what they don't control. The adaptive work is making sure we're focused on the right questions. We're focused on making sure we do work together, that we do collaborate, that we do engage our parents, that we do motivate our students. The morale of your teachers how willing they are to go the extra mile, how, how they feel about their work itself is an adaptive issue. It's adaptive because you can't make people work hard, can you? Doesn't matter how much you pay them, you can't make them work hard. You can't make them show caring, compassion for their students. But I have never been to a high-performing school where people don't work hard. I've never seen a high-performing school where teachers aren't truly caring about their students. Never seen one. And that's why the adaptive work is so important. I often say the adaptive work and the technical work is like trying to understand the difference between a marriage that's strong and healthy and a marriage that's on the verge of collapse. Most people don't get married because they see someone and say, you know, I would like to pay bills with you for the rest of my life. <laughs> Although any of us who've been married know that that's part of being married, right? You gotta pay the bills together, otherwise the things don't work out. But if that's all you do together, what happens? It starts to fall apart, doesn't it? Because there's no communication, there's no relationship, hopefully a little romance. The marriage starts to collapse. And if your children don't love you, then you'd say, why am I feeding these kids anyway? <laughs> a marriage like a school can never simply be a place where people show up. It has to be about a mission, a sense of purpose. And so part of what I want you to think about over the course of your time here is what's the mission of your school? Not what the mission statement says. Lots of places I go, there's a mission statement up on the wall. That, that people don't even look at it. They don't even know what the heck that is, right? What's holding you together? What's, what are people accountable for? What are the values that's driving your work? That's the adaptive work. 
And yes, you've got to do the technical work, but if you don't find a way to make time for the adaptive work, your school's not going to make a difference, particularly those of you who are serving children with great needs. So I want to start by asking you what kind of work you're doing right now. How are you spending your time? The key adaptive question to ask is, in some ways, you would think the most simple question of all. That is, what does it take to educate the children we serve? And it sounds simple, except that I would say, if your data shows that certain groups of kids, certain types of kids, you don't know how to serve them, then you actually, as a staff, don't know how to answer that question. Because to answer the question, you actually have to know something about the students you serve. You have to know about their lives outside of school, about the challenges they face, about the needs they come with. You have to know something about how they learn when they're not with you, because we don't teach children with empty heads. We teach children who have knowledge and experience, who are learning all the time. How many of you have seen children who have memorized the lyrics to hundreds of songs, but can't seem to retain anything in school? Is it a memory issue, or is there really a problem of relevance and meaningfulness that's not been addressed? How do our children learn to cook, learn to garden, learn to fix a car? Is it through lecture? Or do they learn by doing? Do they learn at the side of someone who knows through trial and error? How close is the way they expected to learn in school to the way they're actually learning outside of school? The typical middle school student knows more about technology than the typical middle school teacher and is more comfortable with it. You get a new smartphone, what do you have to do? Give it to one of those kids. Say, show me how to use this phone. And they will download apps you've never even heard of, right? And what do we do? Say, take it away from them, right? Because we know they know more than we do, so we get no phones allowed here. <laughs> How do your children learn? What motivates them? What interests them? The more we know about who we serve, the more we'll know about how to serve them. And that's work that's ongoing work, not work you do once, because our children are constantly changing. Sometimes, even the course of a year, they change. And so knowing our students is a key part of the adaptive work, but there's more involved. We've also got to know what our staff needs to know in light of what our students need. If our students are struggling in reading, that means we need a staff that knows how to teach reading. If our students struggle in, uh, with fractions or with decimals, we need a staff that can teach that. Again, what does your data show you? about the needs of your students, because the needs of your students are, in effect, the needs of your teachers. If you have children that can't write, guess what? You have teachers that can't teach writing. There's got to be an alignment between the student needs and the teacher's capacities, their skills, their strengths. If you're in a district, how many of you are in districts with changing demographics, large immigrant populations moving in? Raise your hand. Lots of hands. Guess what we know now? You can't solve that by hiring a couple ESL teachers. Because those kids need to know math and science. That means what? That means every teacher's got to become a teacher of English, regardless of the content area. And that's not going to happen overnight, but that is a part of the capacity building work to make our teachers more skilled over time so they can work with the kinds of students we're serving. If you're in a school with large numbers of children with learning disabilities, then we need a staff that can work with children with different kinds of learning disabilities. So what does your data suggest your staff needs to work on? And we need to recognize, and it's mentioned in this, the principles, is that professional development needs to be personalized and differentiated because all our teachers don't need the same things. Some need to focus on the content, some need to focus on different pedagogical strategies. Some need to focus on the relationship building. What does your staff need? And how do we make sure they're getting the help they need so they can serve our students? Who should your partners be? I know probably many of your schools have partners. I'm going to describe some schools that have developed very creative partnerships based on the recognition that some of the needs the children bring, they can't solve by themselves. Schools that are working with hospitals, schools that are working with churches and businesses to address needs and to build their capacity to respond to the needs of their students. Who are your partners? 
to the principals in the room, I'll tell you this. You can't wait for someone to come and help you, can you? You can't just sit in your office and pray, I hope they come to help me today. I need some help in this school. That's not going to happen. you got to go get it. you got to go figure out who's going to be my partner and go and know how to attract the resources your school needs. you got to be entrepreneurial and resourceful. So who should the partners be? How are you going to create a culture and a climate that's conducive to good teaching and learning? Here's what we know now from the research and reform. If you change the curriculum but don't change the culture, nothing changes. If you bring in new technology but don't change the culture, nothing changes. You could paint the building and get a whole new facility, but if the culture is sick and dysfunctional, nothing will change. And what is culture? Culture is attitudes, beliefs, relationships, expectations, norms. What is the culture of your school? And what are you doing to create a culture where students truly value education and know that this is a place where the adults care about me, where learning is sacred, a place that's safe, not because you have lots of security guards and metal detectors, but because the relationships are so strong that people let you know if something's going to happen. If there's going to be a fight, if someone has a weapon, they let you know this kid is in trouble. Culture is what distinguishes the best schools from the others. What are you doing to create a strong, positive culture? And here's the key. You can't impose a culture on a school, can you? Can't do it. Wish we could solve this problem. Cultures require buy-in. They require every member of the staff. And I don't just mean the teachers. I mean the custodian. I mean the people in the front office. Every member of that staff understanding what we're about, how we work with children, how we work with each other. How we work with those parents. I could always say I could tell a lot about the culture of a school, usually by how I'm greeted at the front office. And I could tell even more when I walk through the halls by what I see on the walls, or in the teacher's lounge by what I overhear, or in the playground when I see the children playing and how they conduct themselves. Because when I see that adults don't know how to behave and the children don't know how to behave, I know this is probably a place that's not going to be successful at teaching and learning. So if you're wondering about your culture, I would say this is a question to ask an outsider. Ask a visitor to come to your school and ask them, what do they pick up on? What does it feel like to be at our school? Because sometimes when you're immersed in a place, you start to take certain things for granted. And one of the things we most often take for granted is the importance of partnerships with parents. And here's what we know about student achievement. Over 50% of student achievement is influenced by what's happening at home. Over 50%. You look at your highest performing students and ask yourselves now, how many of those students have no parental support? And chances are very, very few of them. Because most of our best students have some parent at home, like Jennifer's mom, who's pushing, who's encouraging, who's making sure she gets to bed on time, making sure they turn off the TV, making sure the work is done. You don't have to have a college degree to do those things. But you need to understand your role. Do, their parent, do your parents understand their role? Are they your partners? Are they working with you? And if they're not, what are you doing to build a partnership? Do you have a staff that knows how to talk to your parents? Guess what? Most schools of education don't teach teachers how to talk to parents, especially if they're from a different racial background or ethnic or socioeconomic background. And that's often when the conversations become more challenging. Your parents will either be your biggest allies or your biggest problem. How are you going to make them allies? Allies that are working for the same goals you have, an important part of the work and important to make sure that we are making time for that part of the work. I won't spend too much time on this, but it is important to ask ourselves, why is it that we've been at the business of reform for so long now and we still have so many schools that are in trouble? So many schools with high dropout rates, so many schools where middle class people with options would not put their children. That's what we have across the country today. And I would say so much of it is because reform is done to schools, not with schools. Reform is never evaluated. It's 
done through fads and gimmicks. So my encouragement to you is don't go for the gimmicks. Dig deep. Be deliberate. Focus on your data. Look at the outcomes. Do the outcomes change? When you try something new, what happens? Be willing to change course if it's not working. But also be willing to ask tough questions. And those of you who are in leadership, if you can't stand in front of your staff and take on tough questions, then you shouldn't lead. You shouldn't lead. Because smart people will have questions, should have questions. And in many schools, the most cynical people out there about reform are our teachers. A lot of teachers know, you know what, we tried this before. I've been, if you've been around long enough, they come back at it with a new name, don't they? And many teachers know if I just ignore this person, close my door, they will eventually go. This too shall pass. And what, that, what happens then, it means that the opportunity for genuine change, for really taking on the work, gets lost. So again, I want to acknowledge that there's a lot of problems at the political level that make this work more difficult. But at the site level, we can do it differently. We can respect each other. We can really engage each other. We can ask each other the tough questions and plan together and hold each other accountable. Because it's that kind of work that results in genuine change over time. So what's the conversation like in your school right now? What are you spending time talking about? There's an important study done on school reform out of the University of Chicago two years ago. It produced a book called Organizing Schools for Improvement. A very important study because it was done while Secretary Duncan was the superintendent of schools in Chicago. And the question that was asked was, why did some schools get better and some schools not? And since many of the reforms that were implemented in Chicago have now become embraced under Race for the Top, I would hope that they've read that book. Unfortunately, I have a feeling they didn't because it's not reflected in the policies yet. But one of the findings, or the findings, were what? You have to have five ingredients, and they all have to be there for schools to have sustained improvement over time. And a lot of them are reflected in your principles. You have to have a coherent instructional guidance system. That means teachers have to get that kind of real classroom-based support in content area. Because the best professional development is site-based. It's ongoing. It's not episodic. It has to have, you have to have an ongoing focus on developing the capacity of the faculty, again, based on student needs. That means we recognize that teaching is intellectual work. And our teachers have to continue to learn if they're going to be effective at what they do. You got to have strong parent community ties. Again, the research showed this. That when the parents are involved and the parents are supporting the school, the school does better. You got to have a student centered learning climate where students appreciate and become invested as learners. And you've got to have leadership that can drive the change. All five have to be there, not four out of five, nothing less. Ask yourself now as you think about your school, where are we strong, where are we weak? What should we be focused on? Because that'll tell you a lot about where or whether you're making progress. Capacity building requires that we focus deliberately on understanding the quality of our schools. Right? Understanding the strengths and weaknesses. What do we need to prioritize? And let's recognize you can't do it all at once. I often worry about schools that they try to change the English curriculum and change the math at the same time, and teachers are on overload. You've got to pace it. You've got to prioritize. And again, even as you focus on understanding what the work needs to be done, that becomes then the work that the staff's got to do. And a key part of that work is constantly building a sense of community amongst the staff so there's shared ownership over the work. The only person in the school who feels a sense of urgency about it is the principal, you're in trouble. Every member of the team's got to own this, feel like they're part of the solution. There's got to be a recognition that it's not just the academic needs of children have to be addressed, but also their non-academic needs. 
How many of you serve children who don't eat regularly? Does hunger affect learning? Pretty good research on that. I think those of you who missed lunch today probably say, yeah, I am affected right now, right? <laughs> How many of you have children who might come to school with a bad tooth or who have trouble reading because they haven't gotten their eyes examined? They might need eyeglasses. Or children have hearing problems but have not been diagnosed. Or kids who don't have stable homes or no coat in the winter. Abraham Maslow called this the hierarchy of human needs. Right? And what's at the base of that hierarchy? Shelter, nutrition, safety, love. All you have to do is look at which children are not thriving in your school, and you will almost always find children whose needs are not being met. Now, I would also add here, which children are we most likely to punish? The children with the greatest needs. And how will we punish them? By denying them school time. Think about the logic behind that strategy. So we have kids who don't like school. We say, OK, go home. Go home and watch TV for a few days. Let's see if that helps improve things. Kids who act out at reading time because they can't read. You ever see that one happen? They want to get sent to the office. And we will oblige them, send them right to the office so they become more disengaged and further behind. The achievement gap and the discipline gap are mirror image of the same phenomena. And if the only thing you're doing is punishing kids and you find you're punishing the same kids over and over again, then you know what that means? It means it ain't working. That's what it means. Because the goal of discipline is to change behavior. That's the goal of discipline. Lawrence Kohlberg, moral, a psychologist in moral development, said the goal of discipline is to teach children to do what's right even when we're not looking. That's the goal, which means we have to focus on character and values and relationships. So what do you do to address those other parts of education? How many of you have read Paul Tuff's new book, How Children Succeed? Add that to your summer reading list if you haven't. How Children Succeed, and he, what he does in this important new book is he examines all the research coming out of cognitive science about what are now called the social and emotional components to learning. And what they find is that increasingly test scores and even IQ is less predictive of success in life than certain kinds of attributes like the ability to defer gratification, the ability to regulate your impulses, the ability to work with others and to listen. There's a whole set of what some call non-cognitive skills that are essential to success in life. Don't show up on the state exams, though. How do you make sure that's part of the strategy, too, that we are using to embrace our children? We need to make sure, again, that we're creating a culture, a culture where it's cool to be smart. Ask yourself now, do my children think it's cool to be smart? Are they also appreciating the importance of learning? So that this summer, we don't have to worry. Even if they're not in summer school, they're going to be reading this summer. Because we have developed in our children a love of reading. The library is going to be swamped because they're going to be there. How many of you think that's going to happen this summer? But isn't that what we're really after? Kids who develop that passion for learning, kids who develop a love of learning that extends well beyond the school year. Because we know there are lots of kids that end up falling further behind in the summer because summer's a dead time except for affluent kids, because most affluent kids are going to be in nice, enriched summer programs. They're not going to be spending their time watching TV and playing video games. And so the gap between the rich and the poor widens, typically, in the summer. So we need to make sure that, again, we are thinking comprehensively about our students and about our schools and about the parents we serve, because it is when we make these connections that we start to see change. Let me give you a few examples where this is happening across the country, because this capacity building work is happening in schools. It's happening in places like PS 188. Now, in New York City, we have very fancy names for our schools. And PS 188 stands for Public School 188 in the Lower East Side, Houston Street. All the kids from 188 come from the housing projects next door. The principal of that school, Barbara Slayton, said, I need a partner to meet the needs of these kids, because several of her parents had substance abuse problems. So her partner became St. Vincent Hospital, which provided mental health services to parents. 
She also decided she would open up on site an internet cafe that stays open till 11 o'clock at night. They use it during the day for her kids, use it for after school support. After 6 o'clock, parents can use it. And parents are in there working on the computers, doing job searches. They even do workshops for parents on how to use the computers. It's a resource now to the community. She has an extended day program where kids can get art and music. And there's a poetry writing program taught by a real live poet. Now, we can do that in New York City because we have lots of unemployed poets around. <laughs> but they decided to have a real poet teach the class because they want someone who has a passion for literacy, a passion for poetry, to teach children. So they might cultivate that love of poetry in children. So PS188 is thinking about neighborhood resources. PS28, again, another creative name we have in New York City, out in Bedford-Stuyvesant, they decided to go further. Sadie Silva decided she needed a partnership with the YMCA so that her kids would have an extended day because 40% of her children are homeless. 40%. And she wanted to make sure that the kids were not on the street before the shelter opened. So they stay open every night till 6. And she formed another partnership with the job training agency to make sure her parents who want it can get a GED or can learn English because she believes that if parents are educated and employed, they'll do a better job with their children. She has another partnership with a local medical school that brings in an optometrist and a dentist, and kids get the immunizations there because many of those children come from families where they don't have access to good, regular health care. When I visited the school, I sat, on, I sat in on a professional development workshop conducted by two social workers focused on how to respond to the social and emotional needs of children. And I listened as teachers posed questions based on real issues they were having with their students. One teacher said, I have a child with an attachment issue. He's attached to my leg, and I cannot teach. And they said, well, you're going to have to get him to earn your attention. They gave him some strategies. Try these things. Come back tomorrow. Let us know how it worked. Another teacher said, I have a child who is depressed. Another one had a child who has anxiety issues. Another one said, I have a child who's aggressive, and he's spitting at other children. And I'm listening to the conversation and the creative suggestions, recommendations, because it's not like these are everything's going to work. Right? You've got to try it out, and then you've got to see if it doesn't work, we're going to try something new. And I say to the principal, what made you decide to offer this as a form of professional development for your teachers? She said, well, until I did, my teacher was referring too many children to special education. And if I didn't do this, I'd have classes full of special ed kids. Meanwhile, no kids in our regular ed classrooms. I said, so my teachers had to become more skilled at meeting these social and emotional needs. One of the things that struck me when I visited the classroom is every classroom had at least five adults. I said, where are you getting all these teachers from? She said, well, they're not all teachers. She said, our special ed teachers are working right with the regular ed teacher. Kids can't tell the difference because they work together as a team in the classroom. She said, but the other three are parents we've trained to assist teachers. And they work as the teacher's assistants. I said, do they get paid? She said, they don't get paid at all. I said, but they're here. And I'm happy they're here. I see one parent standing next to a little boy, very close. I said, why is she so close to him? She said, well, he has trouble settling down in the morning. And I'm really glad she's here today. Parents are a resource. The community is a resource. And because it is, PS28 got the highest gains in literacy in all of Brooklyn last year, in a school where the demographics would suggest not possible, not possible. But it is because they don't ignore the needs of children. They respond, and they respond creatively. Again, who are your partners? Who should they be? Schools like the East Bay Biotech Academy. Now, I had a role in developing the East Bay Biotech Academy because I was working as chief of staff to the mayor of Berkeley in 1988. Very frustrated with my job because that was the job where you had to deal with all the problems facing the city. And we had a lot of problems. We had drug trafficking. We had drive-by shootings. We had homelessness post in the parks. It was a mess. And one day, a friend who was an administrator in the local public schools comes to me, and he says, Pedro, I want you to convince this young man to become the student body president of my school. Now, I don't know this young man, but I immediately take a look, and I'm wondering why him, because he doesn't look like presidential material. 
He's got thick gold chains. He's got gold teeth. He's got gold rings. And I figure anybody with this much gold is probably doing something illegal. And why would you want him to be the president of your school? But after a few minutes of talking to the young man, it becomes clear this young man is very intelligent. He's charismatic. He's going to run the school either way. And the principal realizes he needs this young man on his side, not against him. So I'm taken by this young man. I'm taken by the willingness of the principal to work with him. I said, I'd like to visit your school, because I didn't know we had this alternative school in the community. He said, well, come. We could use your help. And I show up the next day, and in a community that takes great pride in being one of the first in the country to integrate its schools, I find a school that's totally segregated. But it's hard to tell it's a school because there are more kids out in the parking lot hanging out by their cars, clouds of smoke in the air, not all cigarette smoke. No more than two or three kids in the classroom. Ask the teachers what's like to work here, they say, no problem. One of them says, I, we don't bother them, they don't bother us, everybody gets along here. <laughs> I go back to talk to the principal, I say, you have a big problem here. He said, I only have two problems. I said, just two? He said, yep. He said, the teachers and the kids. I said, well, those are two big ones. I said, what are you going to do? He says, well, I can deal with the teachers. I said, how? He said, I'm going to require they come with a lesson plan every period, every day. He said, I just don't know how to get these kids back. He said, will you go talk to them? I said, okay. I thought it was a radical idea to talk to the kids. So I went out and started talking to the kids to find out what they're doing. And the first thing I learned surprised me. All of these students were old enough to quit if they wanted to. But they weren't quitting. They were coming to school. It didn't mean they were doing any work. They were coming to school because they still thought they needed that degree. And their friends were there. And I spent some more time talking, and I started to realize the overriding concern these kids had was survival. Because they were coming of age, and they knew they wouldn't have to be out there on their own supporting themselves. And many of them didn't have the means or the ability to do so. So I would go back to the principal and say, we need a strategy to show these kids that they can earn a living and get an education at the same time. He said, well, how do we do that? Well, because I'd been in the mayor's office, I knew there was a biotech company in Berkeley called Bayer Laboratory. They produced Bayer Aspirin, among other things, a German firm. And they were in the process of negotiating with the city for the right to expand. I said, I'm going to ask them if they would invest in creating a biotech academy at our school. And because they're a German company, and in Germany they use apprenticeships as a model for involving young people in technical fields, he said, this makes so much more sense than anything the city's asked. And so we commenced to build this academy. The requirement was, was four years of, of, of science, four years of math, which was unheard of for our students. Because up until that point, all we offered was remedial writing, remedial reading, remedial math. That's because we equated being low-skilled with being unintelligent. Many of them were low-skilled but were not unintelligent. They simply had not had the opportunity to learn. So we built a lab on site. We built a, 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 the corresponding lab in the schools, gave kids internships. When you graduate from the program, you were guaranteed a $14 an hour job in biotech because you work directly under a biotechnician. It's amazing what happens. You put these kids in a white coat and some goggles. Some of them start to really think they're scientists. And then we decided, you know, it's not good enough to just have these entry-level jobs. Why not make this a career pathway? And so we started to build partnerships with community colleges. And then a four-year school. And today, 18 years later, that biotech academy, the East Bay Biotech Academy, has seven high schools, five biotech firms as partners, two community colleges. And that high school that was a dumping ground for bad kids and bad teachers is today a viable alternative for children who don't fit into a traditional high school. What are you doing to build partnerships and create pathways to opportunity? I'm on the board of a group called Year Up right now. Year Up, its mission is to close the opportunity divide. We have served 1,800 young people already, get them kids with GEDs who are now earning $50,000 a year in the finance and high-tech sector. Our mission is to serve a million over the next 10 years. No public support for this project. Lots of private support. But we're showing that even with young people who are low-skilled, if we get them the focus and attention, we can get them career ready. So we're building partnerships. And we're doing things like 
what Brockton High School has done. Brockton High School decided in 1998, when Massachusetts was about to implement their high stakes exams, and Massachusetts has the most rigorous exams in the country, a group of teachers got together and said, you know what? Our kids will not pass this exam because too many of them come into high school reading at a third and fourth grade level. And to do well in this exam, you need at least a 10th grade level. And you, you can't even do the math if you're not strong in literacy. So they went to the principal. They came with a suggestion and said, we will train our colleagues on how to teach literacy regardless of what subject they teach, right across the curriculum. Mm -hmm. And the principal, Sue Satchwitz, said, well, great idea, but I have no money to pay them. She said, we're going to do it voluntarily. And at first, certain people got on board because they were doing it in the prep periods, they were doing it after school, they were doing it at lunch, but not everybody. Some people say, I teach math, I'm not teaching literacy. And I teach P, I definitely don't teach literacy. But in 2002, when the first exams were delivered, over 60% of their kids passed. They had been projected that over 50% would fail. That caught their attention. They said, well, this literacy thing is working. So they continued. And they continued to train each other. And they focused on giving differentiated training because the literacy in math is not the same as the literacy in history. So they tailored it. In a school with a very high population of English language learners, they wanted to make sure that that was part of the training as well. So by 2006, over 80% of the kids passed. This caught the state's attention. Because Brockton has the largest high school in the state, 4,100 students. Well, they kept going. They said 80% is not good enough. By 2010, they had over 90% passing. 2012, 98% of their kids passed. One third of the senior class got the highest possible score to qualify for the state college scholarship, free education at any public university in Massachusetts. If you look at that picture, it's hard to see it from where you are. One third of that class African American, one third Hispanic, the other third low income white students. They didn't change who they serve, they changed how they serve them. Brockton is an example of a school that has deliberately built the capacity to meet the needs of the students they serve. And I could go on, but I don't have the time. But all of these schools have a vision, a comprehensive vision that places teaching and learning at the center. So teachers focus on learning, take ownership of learning. They teach with a focus on evidence of learning and even on mastery. So kids are not, it's not content to just have kids pass. They want to know, can they really write? Can they really do the math? They focus also on issues like extended learning opportunities, Saturday school, summer school, after school. Why? Because some kids need more. They're not getting enough during a traditional school year. They focus on issues like safety, both the physical safety but also the psychological safety because they know there's a lot of bullying happening out there in cyberspace. And again, relationships are the key to creating a truly safe school where kids can learn. They focus on family engagement. And they focus on health and nutrition and all the other things that we know go into creating a well-rounded person. These schools exist right now. I'll bet you right there out in the audience there are schools like it here in North Carolina that are doing the work. If you're unfortunate enough to, have, to be at a school where you've never seen kids like you serve thriving, You've never seen kids like the ones that are struggling right now in your school excelling. Then ask the folks from new schools, where do those schools exist? Can we go on a tour? Can we go visit? Because the proof is in seeing these kids achieve. And some of your teachers need to see that proof. Because sometimes they actually believe the, the problem is the children. And unless we get some new kids in here, they don't know if this can be done. And so changing beliefs can't simply be about a mantra or imploring them to work harder. They've actually got to know it can be done. So add this to your reading list. Karen Chenoweth's book, It's Being Done, where she describes several schools like the ones I've mentioned where the gaps are closing, where the children's backgrounds don't predict their outcomes. Schools like Eagle Academy in the South Bronx, and I'll close with this example. Eagle Academy was a school created for young men in the South Bronx because David Banks, the founder, decided they were losing too many young men to prison, to gangs, to early deaths. He said, I need to create a school where the culture of the school is more powerful than the culture of the streets. Now, the first time I ran into the young men from Eagle Academy was on a train. 
And anybody who takes the subway in New York knows the worst time to take the subway is at 3.30 when school lets out. Because the kid's going to be loud. It's going to be chaotic. But there I was, headed uptown. And it was loud and chaotic. But amidst all the chaos on the train, I see these three young men in ties. And I notice one offers his seat to an older person on the train. And I assumed at first that they were Mormons. Because we often have Mormons in the area. And I go to talk to them and say, no, we're not Mormons. So we're from Eagle Academy. I said, from Eagle Academy? I said, where are you guys coming from? They said, we're coming from the Museum of Natural History. I said, well, where's your teacher? They said, we know how to get to the Bronx ourselves. We do it every day. I said, well, who taught you to offer your seat the way you did? I, just, I noticed that. And they said, well, that's the Eagle way. It's the Eagle way. Now I said, well, now I'm curious. I want to find out about the Eagle way. And I get to the school and I discover their strategy for creating a school where the culture of the school is more powerful than the culture of the streets is to create a prep school for these young men. Just in the same vision of an Andover, an Exeter, prep school in South Bronx. So kids have a rich array of electives. They have a very powerful culture. If you go to the induction ceremony at the beginning of the year in the fall, it's run by the 12th graders who introduce the 9th graders to the uniform, to the conduct code, to what it means to be an Eagle student. They believe at Eagle Academy that if you elevate their minds, they will elevate their pants themselves. Okay. Now, I got to see the young men from Eagle Academy at work during the robotics competition. They do robotics down here in North Carolina. And they're using robotics as a way to really impress upon kids the importance in the, in the application of math and science. And there were 3,000 kids in the auditorium at Javits Center. I was asked to be a judge. I know nothing about robots, to let you know. But there I am judging. And I find out the kids from Eagle Academy have come in sixth place. That's six out of 80 teams. So I go to tell them the good news, and they start jumping up and down celebrating. I said, well, that's great, but unfortunately, only the top three teams go to the finals at the Georgia Dome. And those top three schools were the top exam schools in New York City. They said, well, we still think six is pretty good. I said, I agree. I think it's very good. I said, explain to me how you built the robot. So one kid brings out his notes, and he starts showing me all these formulas. And I don't understand a word of what he's talking about. I said, well, that's very impressive. <laughs> I said, well, what adult helped you build the robot? They said, well, the first adult to help us was our custodian. I said, the custodian helped you build a robot? They said, that's right. He gets us the parts. We don't know where he gets the parts from, but whenever we need something, <laughs> he gets it. He's very important to this robot. I said, well, who else helped you? I said, well, our science teacher helped us. There he is. And he, I see a man, he's in a chair half asleep. I said, wow, he looks out of it. Then he gets up, he says, listen, I've been up until 3 in the morning with these kids. I said, you guys work till 3 in the morning? He said, these kids have been working six, sometimes seven days a week, evenings, for the last three months. I said, you guys work evenings and weekends? They all shake their heads. I said, you get paid? Nobody gets paid. He said, not even me. I don't get paid either. He said, but their enthusiasm keeps me coming. And then I ask a question. I say, OK, well, you're coming in sixth place. You don't go to the Georgia Dome. What do you want to do next? And all 12 of these young men from the South Bronx, from a community that is more likely to send them to prison than anywhere else, they told me they all want to be mechanical engineers. Now, what's interesting about that aspiration is there are no mechanical engineers in the neighborhood. It's hard to aspire to something that you've never seen, isn't it? But these young men now believe they can be mechanical engineers because of what they were involved in, because they're in a school where it's cool to be smart, because their dreams were nurtured and they were allowed to aspire to something else. It shifted their whole identity about what's possible. Great schools can do that. Great schools convince our kids that knowledge is power. What is your school doing right now? What's the message your kids are getting? The future of this country will be determined by what's happening in our schools. It's that important. And regardless of what our policymakers are doing, we have to stay focused on that work because many of you I see are going to be thinking about retirement in a few years. Right? Well, guess what? If these kids are not well educated, we are all in trouble. Because if they're not gainfully employed, Social Security is in big trouble. So we're all in this together. And because of the commitment you've made to serve our children, I encourage you to stay focused on the work even when it's hard, even when you're listening to that, or that same staff member you don't like, right? but you know you need to work with, because it does take a willingness to collaborate, 
to plan, to challenge each other respectfully, to get, create the schools our children deserve. Thank you for doing that work, and thank you for the time this afternoon.